so hi and uh, welcome everyone to mulesoft my sur meetup group so thanks for joining and happy new year okay so today we are uh, having this topic like designing how we can design fault fault tolerant apis and how we can keep our application network intact okay so today we have vijay raghavan with us okay so before uh, the presentation let me read out some safe harbor statement so both the speaker and the host are organizing this meetup in individual capacity only we are not representing our companies here this presentation is strictly for learning purpose only okay this presentation not meant for any promotional activities okay so some housekeeping rules we are recording this so we will be uploading that to the events page uh, in 24 hours within 24 hours okay and questions you can just uh, your mic is kind of enabled so you can just enable and ask questions with the speaker at any time so make it interactive and ask any don't be hesitate to ask any doubts okay and give us feedback so today we have two organizers for this meetup okay uh, myself um, i am shubham chaurasia working as a professional integration developer in millennium and uh, so i am all mules already all mules of certified mules of mentor mules of meetup leader and that's all about me so what do you agree thank you shubham so good morning everyone thanks for joining us today so this is our first meetup and happy new year to everyone uh, in 2023 and today we have vijay to walk to us on fault tolerant api uh, uh, how we can uh, deal with the fault tolerant api so myself i'm greeter i'm working at Aston as a senior architect i'm certified in all mulesoft certifications and then uh, aws uh, professional uh, architect as well yep we have Vijay today. So, over to you, Vijay. Yes. You miss. So, yeah, let me share my screen. Oh, my screen is visible. Yes, yes, it, yes is. it is. So thank you, Giri and Shubham for inviting me to the meetup. So a so little introduction about me. So uh, so I'm Vijay Raghavan Vengadhari and uh, I'm working as an integration architect at uh, EOI GDS. So my overall experience is more than 11 years and uh, uh, specifically on integration and uh, EAP arena. And uh, I worked around uh, uh, multiple integration API product in IBM uh, technologies and as well as in Mulesoft. So uh, my certifications are in like IBM. I have six uh, certifications active in IBM and uh, two active certifications in Mulesoft. Also uh, having a significant experience in cloud technologies. So this is a short introduction about me. And yeah, let's get started. So today's agenda is on you know designing your API as fault tolerant to keep your application at intact. So we're gonna have you know uh, understanding of the basic fundamentals that is uh, how the API led approach is working, and how the application network is evolving from API led approach, and uh, how the API invocation failure that is going to impact your application network, and what is fault tolerant API at first place. And what are all the strategies to design your API to acquire the fault tolerance and uh, discussion of your use cases. And uh, subsequently, we'll be having a short demo, uh, like how we can implement the fault tolerant API. And uh, eventually, we'll be having the Q&A session. So let's get started. So as you guys are aware, right? So, uh, so Mulesoft introduced the API-like connectivity approach. So why do we need the API-like connectivity approach? So it it comes with the granularity, like wherever uh, we are developing an API. So we are going to segregate that into three layers. So starting with experience, process, and system layer. So each layer having its own uh, indications of, you know, and uh, responsibility at what is supposed to do on that layer. So here comes the system API, which is uh, lying, lying under the system layer. So that is specifically to you know uh, unlock the data from your actual backend. And, and uh, you have the native model of data and you're going to unlock everything through your system layer. And the process API that's just in the process layer, which is going to orchestrate and do the business logic when it is going to interact with your system layer. So 
technically process api is meant for orchestration and processing the data so orchestration and processing data it means like handling all the business logic and uh, you know consolidate the response uh, whatever is required for the actual upstream api client and the experience api which lies in experience layer which is going to deliver the unique experience to the api client so whosoever the api client is going to invoke the mules of layer so they are going to pass through all these layers to get the actual data what they want and what what the experience they require they have to pass through this so this is an approach you guys are already aware of uh, how the mule soft is coming up with but the key factor here is this api lit connectivity approach you know uh, act as an essential aspect for you know uh, evolving the application network in an enterprise so when we talk about application network so when you take an enterprise or an organization, so it would be having a lot of systems. So that would be enough components uh, that could be a legacy or system, or it could be a, a newly built uh, CRM system, or it could be any transient decision-making components, or it would even you know connect with the third party of that organization uh, when it comes to B2B integration or when it comes to uh, B2C integrations. So you would be having variety of uh, components sitting in the you know sitting in the enterprise architecture, and each components having its own platform and technologies implementation. So that's where the integration and API comes into picture, you know, to orchestrate the data and system integration through the API layers. So as you want to implement this uh, multi-level layers as an API-led connectivity approach, it automatically evolves it as an application network. So when I say application network, you would be able to point the data from each different system. So if you want to have a data from a uh, target uh, system B towards a source system A, so it obviously gets connected through APIs. So through this, you are creating a transparency across the enterprise through your API, where the data uh, transformation and uh, data transfer is pretty much transparent and easier. So this is a pretty much on application network when you are developing an API. But more importantly, what we are going to see today is something on, you know, uh, what makes the application network to fail or not, what makes the application network to be a failed one. So that's where the point we are talking about. So this is specifically on, you know, on when you are going to solution uh, an architecture for your organization or when you're going to design an, you know, a framework for an organization. This is highly required. So ideally, when an API development starts, so the base requirement is to meet your business requirement. Like you just simply you know, list it out, like what is going to be your source and what is going to be your target and what, what will be your you know, source data and what will be your target data and what is the source expected out of the API call. So that's the initial business requirement everybody focus on. But there is a non-functional requirement to handle it. So the non-functional requirements are, you know, always comes to the last or sometimes it get ignored and uh, always say ignore is a bliss, but here ignorance is not a bliss. So when you ignore it, you're gonna end up with the problems, you know, when you're going to run up in production. So the non-functional requirement to have to, you know, how you can keep your API safe and how you can keep your API healthy so that it makes intact your application network. So when you talk about that, there's a point of failure in your application network. For example, the reason we are having this uh, api led connectivity approach for the reusability purpose so it whatever the api you are developing it becomes an asset so each asset is you know being reusable for example uh, you know let's say you have a component so which is going to you know give you the list of activity uh, about the user that is coming in so that particular component being used by multiple system for you know tracking and auditing purpose for that, you are having a dedicated system API developed for that particular component to get the data. But that system API is going to be reused by multiple process layers. Like uh, each process layer, you know, uh, talks to the corresponding experience layer where the you know individual source system will you know connect to that. So when there is a point of failure under a system layer, it is going to break your application network. So that becomes you know your application network unstable and it's unhealthy which will lead to the you know uh, loss of customer experience and uh, and the monetary benefit it gonna leads to a loss of revenue as well so let's talk about a scenario of you know it's a uh, e-commerce organization so the e-commerce organization the bread and butter is you know the order from the customer 
so when people are making an order and if you you know people are making inquiry about the list of items that is available to an organization so they have to you know go through the process so if any of the uh, you know services down or any of the uh, api is down because of some reason definitely it is going to you know piss off the customer for example you're going to make an uh, you know specific you know laptop order in amazon and if you are going to note that the amazon site is down then obviously you're going to switch back to another competitor called flipkart and you're going to order from there so this makes uh, you know the customer switch easier because of the you know irregularity in your application network so though we are talking today on technical standpoint it is going to benefit from the business standpoint so let's talk about you know how in api invocation failure impacts the application network so ideally the api invocation failures are when there is a hardware issue uh, let's talk about general terms so when there is an hardware issue on the web api implementation when i say the hardware issue probably uh, the api that is running or the downstream system that is running in the uh, uh, on bare metal or it could be a uh, one of the worker in the cluster or it could be a you know cloud hosted uh, environment if anything goes down so definitely you know that particular api becomes unavailable and uh, upstream api client that is calling this api uh, web api implementation is going to fail and also there are other factors we have to consider which are environment issues such as uh, you know it could be a operating system issue or it could be a you know uh, jvm heap size issue library issues and sometimes network component issues as well when there is an issue in the load balancer when there is an issue in the router so all this leads to a failure and eventually if you have a bug in your web api implementation that is going that is also going to fail it so but again uh, on the win-win scenario most of the time you will not have a bug in your web api implementation because whatever you develop it is going through a lot of testing phases and that ensures uh, you know you are delivering a zero code uh, zero defect uh, code to the production but these are general terms but when we segregate on ground we have permanent failure and transient failure that is the key thing we are going to talk about so what are permanent failures so the permanent failures are like which got failed and it cannot be revived i know at, at any point in time so for that you have to make a, you know any uh, manual intervention to make it up for example if the api implementation itself decommission so you're no longer able to you know make a call to the api implementation or if any of your you know security certs got expired because as your uh, api invocation from your api client to the web api implementation it's our tl is secured and the se security of cert certs being expired then obviously you have to replace a cert or for the authentication purpose the credential that you are using for generating a over token or the api key so whatever the credential you're using if it's either invalid or expired that is also going to make you uh, the api invocation failure so all these are kind of client error but technically speaking it is rarely happen so if when it happen there should be a kind of you know steps to resolve it that is a manual uh, uh, step that needs to be done for example if your credentials are expired then you have to talk to the server and get your new credentials and reconfigure your api client and you know deploy it and make the api call again uh, and if the api implementation is decommissioned then you have to you know change your uh, endpoint to call the new uh, web api implementation uh, which is newly introduced or newly exposed or when the security certs are expired obviously you have to upgrade your security certs so these are the you know mitigation failure that you want to do for the permanent failures but the major fact here is what we are going to see about the transient failures so what is transient failures is so being a web api client and you are making a call to the web uh, api implementation that could fail for some reason when there's a sudden uh, network glitch transient network glitch you know because when you're making a call from one uh, api to the downstream system or one api to another api it goes on multiple hops so it goes to the load balancer it goes to the uh, server connection it goes to the actual uh, api implementation so when there is a sudden network law, you know glitch between this any of the hops so definitely you're going to face an issue and uh, Another problem is uh, if any of your web API implementation, the downstream system, it's in a reviving mode. So it already down and it is slowly coming up. So even by that time, uh, you can face that issue. So these are server side issues like which can, you know, uh, ranges in uh, HTTP 500 and uh, 500 and above. So technically, we, we are having a chance to revive the transaction back to successful state on these transient failures.
So as I've already you know indicated, the impact of failed API you know invocation will definitely amplify the impact in application network. So as I mentioned, your APIs are you know reusable, and if one API is down, then definitely it is going to give the error back to the you know uh, upcoming uh, not upcoming it's upstream API uh, API clients. For example, if a system API is failed, then uh, you would be uh, sending back the uh, error to the process API and process API going to send back to the experience API and the experience API going to send back to the actual API client. So uh, this is going to definitely break it. But how we are going to revive the process is somehow, you know, you're going to make in terms of, uh, uh, you know, being your API as a fault tolerant. It is not about, uh, you know, error masking. But it is about, you know, really trying to revive your, you know, transaction into successful state for the transient failures. So, you know, before I move to the transient failures, I'm just going to let you know that these API invocations that we're talking about, uh, the failure that we're talking about is mostly on the transient failure. So we are not going to do anything on the permanent failure because permanent failures are always needs to be fixed and which are going to be kind of one-time activity. But transient failures are, you know, chronic, which is recurring you can you know uh, face the same uh, transient failure you know then and now and uh, even sometimes you know uh, it can occur rarely but it's going to be chronic it's going to keep on coming so definitely you have some kind of uh, a mechanism in place to revive that transaction to successful state and make your api fault tolerant so that internally makes your application network success so let's talk about fault tolerant api so first, let's understand a little bit on the API invocation. So let me switch to this one. So as I have said, so we have a, a friend and application. The application can be kind of, let's say it's an e-commerce site. So it requires some, uh, you know, uh, price information of a particular order item. So it makes the mules of layer So as we're gonna have three layers. Experience, process, and system. And we have one backend, could be a database or it could be a system. So ideally, the friend uh, friend and application of the UI, which is going to be your you know, actual upstream API client, which makes a call to the experience layer. So the front of the front end web API client making a call to the web API implementation of experience layer, it's API invocation. But if you look at the you know standpoint of uh, you know uh, the, the series of API call, the experience layer acts as a API client as well as a web API implementation. If you look at this, the experience layer is a web API implementation for the API client, which is your uh, any of your front end uh, system. Could be let's say as I have talk, talked about, uh, you know, uh, e-commerce site uh, which is going to you know uh, fetch the details for a uh, uh, you know it's kind of a price inquiry for a particular product. Okay, so experience la uh, layer is going to be a web API implementation for your front end, and uh, the same experience layer is going to be a web API client, and it's going to make a call to the process layer, and process layer becomes a web API implementation for the experience layer. The same goes for the system layer. So these, all these layers acts as both the API client and as well as the WebAP implementation. As the response goes by, so the implementation responds back to the API client and eventually it reaches the target audience. So the call from the WebAP client to the WebAP implementation called API invocation. So, Technically speaking, what is fault tolerant here? So when there is a call, when the call is made, for example, let's take a scenario of your process API. The process API, uh, you know, which receives a request from experience API, uh, that again, experience API is going to receive a request from your actual front end. Now the process API has to make a call to the system API and the system API has to make a call to the uh, downstream system. So here, the system API is uh, is the one that is going to uh, make a call to the downstream system to get the actual data, which is going to unlock the data from the backend. So assume there is an issue on the backend, uh, probably it goes for the unplanned outage, or it could be a, a you know um, short-term outage, probably it's due to a transient network glitch. Definitely, it's going to fail. But 
in this case you have to make your process api as fault tolerant and are you have to make your system api as fault tolerant so how you want to do that is a point of question so when you make the uh, system api as fault tolerant then you are not going to uh, you know uh, make the failure or you're not going to expose a failure you know to the upstream layer so you're still going to revive the transaction back to the successful state and the success response will be sent back to the actual upstream api client if you're not going to do that then it is going to be the series of failure and it is going to break your application network so how we are going to do this so you know uh, making this api as a fault tolerant becomes your you know uh, api fault tolerant so how we are going to do this is we have a strategies and we have a list of strategies to follow and uh, that we you know uh, we see one by one which is like implementing a retry mechanism and you know applying the timeouts and applying a circuit breaker and applying the static fallback results and cached fallback results and also fallback web api invocations and uh, there's a final one called opportunistic parallel web api invocations so we're going to see about you know each and every one and then uh, followed with few use cases so first one is the timeout so the timeout is when there is http transaction being made there is an sla when i say there is an sla when a web api when a api client is going to make a call to the API implementation. It works on SLA, the service level agreement. So this API client says, I'm gonna make a call to call to you, to the server, and I am expecting the response at the max of 2000 milliseconds, I would say the two seconds. So on any time, this particular api has to return back the uh, you know the response within this period of time so this api has to handle that you know to ensure that the response is returned back or the error has returned back within this given sla so that's where the timeout comes into picture so when there is a scenario let's say uh, this api implementation calls a backend and there is some kind of uh, you know uh, networking hangout issues then this api client has to ensure that it gets timed out within this two seconds or this api client acts as a, this, a, this web, uh, api server acts as a web api client as well as the web implementation when this is making a call it has to configure the timeout so that before this upstream api client times out it gives a you know response back the response could be uh you know uh, failure response or success response but it has to respond back within the specific period of sla so that's where the timeout configuration comes into picture so when we talk about on the api layer so where are we going to do that so ideally as i'm talking about uh you know uh, we are going to make uh you know the backend call through http for example uh, as we are going multiple ops from uh, you know process to system layer so still we can have the uh, process layer as you know uh, fault tolerant so where we can configure the uh, you know the timeout parameter based on the uh, system level uh, issues for example the call from the process layer to the uh, system layer it's going to happen through the http request configuration so where you can configure a timeout for example you have to calculate the overall sla so the sla consideration should happen from the api client that is the actual api client so for example uh, you are getting a request from the e-commerce site and it is expecting the response in one second so you have to ensure the overall response written back to the api client within that one second so you have to configure the timeout accordingly for example uh, if you are going to uh, uh, you know uh, respond to the front end uh, respond to the actual api client you know within one second so you have to ensure the backend call you are making you know should be less than that so that's how your configuration should lies in terms of all the sla consideration so that there won't be any client time what happens so before the client time what happening you are going to respond back so that's where the timeout configuration comes into picture and uh, the next one is retry so many people having an idea of retry so retry is gen you know is a general common uh, word that you know when there is a failure of calling then you are going to retry it again so 
this retry concept uh, is meant for the transient failures not for the permanent failures and it is also meant for the http item potent safe methods so when we say safe methods for example uh, let's take a scenario of uh, you know um, creating a customer so you cannot you know uh, retry you know, for you know creating a customer because uh, being in synchronous you can end up with you know duplication of records the item potent methods are whichever the method that is going to you know give you the same result you know how many irrespective of the calls that you are making the how many number of calls you are making it gives it's it is going to give you the same response so that uh, becomes your http uh, item button methods so here the retrieval get call head uh, options http methods which are used for the head call option for the uh, course uh, uh, policy and the put and delete for you know either replacing the existing methods or deleting the existing resource so these are the met methods can be really implemented on the retry mechanism and the more important factor here is when you are going to implement a retry you have to consider uh, the retries are you know should be very limited and the uh, frequency between each retry should be very limited because it should again fit in with your overall sla uh, consider uh, again as i as i'm saying uh, your front end requires a response within the matter of two seconds then you have to ensure your timeout parameter your retry parameter everything should fall under place uh, within that you know, uh, stipulated time so it should happen everything within the two seconds you know before it responding back to the client so retry is one of the mechanism and the next one is circuit breaker. So circuit breaker is a very interesting concept that's come from the, uh, come from our you know uh, electronic circuit breaker, and uh, how it works is you know it's pretty easier. So when there is AP invocation failure, so uh, AP client is calling and web AP implementation, and there is a failure happening continuously. Uh, probably this API implementation is down for five minutes for some kind of you know outage reasons, or probably the AV implementation slowly in, you know getting into revival mode so what if there is a you know uh, bombardment of requests that is coming from the api client continuously and for each client uh, each request it has to wait you know uh, for the specific period of time out so for example each request configured for uh, let's say uh, 2 seconds or it's wait you know configured for 5 seconds so that five seconds it is going to hold this http thread continuously so you're getting 100 requests you know probably per second so it means it's going to hold 100 thread continuously for five seconds before it is getting timed out so consider this is a process api and this is going to be a system api and uh, this 100 request is being continuously timed out uh, and uh, this five minutes you're holding the entire thread so because of that you're still going to you know uh, increase the processing over at over it at the processing layer so how you can revive this so as soon as you know this uh, this particular system api is not going to come up in the next five or ten minutes so how we are going to immediately fail it so that's where the circuit breaker comes into picture so circuit breaker you know uh, it's kind of it's a kind of a concept what it does is it's going to monitor the api invocation so as soon as it finds out uh, there is a uh, you know uh, failure in the api invocation then it gonna open a circuit breaker gateway so what it does is it will open the gate called open gate so what it does is as soon as it finds like a certain number of uh, requests being failed it will open the gate so whatever the request that comes after it it will immediately fail uh, because of that what is the advantage we are getting is we are not you know holding that http thread for the period of time until the client itself getting timed out and immediately we are failing back so that the client will understand uh, the api is not available immediately they can make you know uh, make an other alternative or uh, strategy to uh, you know look for other options so it you know open the gate for certain certain number of period uh, or you know for example uh, for the next uh, 60 seconds so it will keep on you know look at the api invocation period of time and it will wait for 60 seconds and uh, gently it will allow one request to the api implementation and if it finds out that this is called you know uh, switching from open gate to open close gate So as soon as it just moves from the open gate to open close gate, it's just going to allow one single request to the web API implementation. And if it finds out this web API implementation succeeded, then it goes to the close gate, which means it's going to allow all the API requests hereafter. 
else if this if the api invocation still failed then again it goes to the open gate so it means again it is going to wait for the next 60 second and it is not going to allow any of your uh, uh, you know web web invocation to come up if it is succeeded the circuit breaker will close off and the regular call will happen so this is the you know general concept of circuit breaker let me go back to the slide so Currently in MuSoft, we don't have any uh, inbuilt or in-house connector to do that. Uh, so we have to uh, know, uh, either to go with our, any of your, you know, uh, you know, custom flows that you can build to uh, build that can act as your circuit breaker, or you can create a custom module uh, and uh, you can, you know, publish it and you know you can utilize it as a, a circuit breaker. So as of now, uh, you know, we don't have an inbuilt uh, uh, circuit breaker connector uh, available in MuSoft, but in the other uh, connectors such as any point mq if you look at we have any point mq circuit breaker configuration so uh, it is you know again inbuilt in the endpoint mq so this any point mq uh, is something that uh, from your runtime plane it makes a call to your control plane uh, uh, you know to drop a message to the queue or to retrieve a message from the queue so if there is a failure that's what circuit breaker you know uh, configuration you know directly configured but we don't have a specific circuit breaker configuration for any http request so you have to go either with your you know own flow that is going to act as a circuit breaker or you have to create a custom module uh, i just missed out a couple of information here for timeout so where you can configure the timeout so obviously you can configure the timeout parameter in your http response connector uh, configuration uh, and then the retry you can utilize uh, the until successful scope you know where you can you know, specify the retry and uh, you have to explicitly handle your error because the until successful will retry irrespective of the error you are getting so you have to uh, you know intelligently handle the error that you're getting and only on the transient failures you have to go for the retries and uh, the next one is uh, invoking a fallback web api so what is the fallback web api let's say you have a process layer and uh, you're getting a price detail from one of the system system api and it's talked to a core inventory repository that talks that, that is having a product information the price information and this is a primary api and you are, you are going to get the information through the system api either your system api is down or the actual backup is down then it, it is called the performance of uh, application network. So this itself becomes a failure. But if such things got failed, then you have to look for fallback. So fallback is probably you have to look for the deprecated version of the you know uh, primary API, uh, which is still available and it's uh, still compatible for your response. Uh, probably may not have the new fields, but still uh, whatever the sufficient field that you're expecting, it's available in the uh, you know the deprecated API. You can still make a call to that. So it is a primary one and certificate API. So if it is not available, you can still make a call to this API and get the response. So you can still talk to the backend. So uh, this is one of the scenario. And assume if the backend is down, then the both uh, your duplicated API as well as the primary API will not be in use. You have to look for other options. For example, there would be a, you know, uh, in general organization will be having a disaster uh, recovery site, which we call DR site. So the DR site would be available for all level of uh, platforms. It even includes, uh, you know, integration. It even includes some of the backend, which will be having the replica of data from the existing, and there will be a constant data sync will happen from the uh, real-time environment to the DR site. So you can make a call to a DR site, DR system API, which can talk to the component that's sitting in the DR. So this is one of the fallback mechanism. And there is another fallback mechanism. There are systems that replicate the same data uh, for probably uh, you know uh, internal uh, tracking purpose or the reconciliation purpose. The same uh, kind of data that is available in one system, it could be available in another system as well. Probably uh, it may not replicate everything, but at least the sufficient information that is you know, looking for. So it can still call another system API, which talk to the a talker system called B. It was A. It can still give you the information that you're looking for. 
so these are the fallback apis we can consider when you implement it at it depends on you know case to case basis you have, so you have to look through in a way uh, like do you have a fallback mechanism in your organization do you have a fallback mechanism where in, in this this are option you have in place okay but not all the organization will you know uh, accommodate this probably one or two would be available or all will be available so it depends on the you know organization that you are currently working for so this is a fallback option so whenever there is a primary api uh, invocation is failing then you have to use your fallback mechanism and the next one is opportunity invoking a fallback web api in parallel and uh, this one is, is still not recommended but it's an option on an exceptional cases why it is not recommended i will explain it's again you know comes talk about the fallback mechanism so the first one is what i'm talking about is when you make a call to the primary api and it's still failing then you're going to call the uh, you know uh, fallback api to get the data but this is a sequential process so this particular activity has to fail in order to make the call to the next one right the opportunistically you know uh, making a call uh, to both the api in parallel which is using a scatter gather you can still make a call you know in parallel to both the apis for the safer side like it uh, to scatter gather you will be making a parallel call to both the apis or both the systems to get the data but ideally this is not recommended why because uh, the data inconsistency and second thing is you are increasing the processing overhead in your application network because these are unnecessary invocation because you have to consider a failure here so how often your uh, you know uh, the primary api is going to fail it's probably like 19% would be successful only 1% there is a chance of failure so only when there is a 1% of chances failure that's where you have to go for the second uh, fallback api call but if you are going to have a parallel invocation right it means all the 100 calls you are making a call 100 times to each of the system which is completely unnecessary so that's the reason this particular approach is not recommended but it is recommended only on the exceptional case where the upstream client is having a strong sla they are expecting the response immediately like within a few milliseconds or a matter of a second and uh, they are not expecting you know uh, any failure then they require 100 percent availability of your application then in that case it can be recommended but this is kind of uh, you know situation we have to think like win-win scenario so this is called opportunistically invoking a fallback web API in parallel and the next one is previously uh, previously cached result as a fallback so it's again a client caching so you guys there would, you guys can have a question like you know we have a you know uh, cache scope that is already available so irrespective of i go to the primary api i can get the data from the caching yes that is one of the option but there are scenarios that you cannot always use the caching for some reason for example the values are often changing you know at the back end level so what you can do is that's where you can still use your you know uh, second option of uh, caching the uh, data in the uh, object store only on the uh, you know revival basis you're not going to still use the cache only when there's a revival options you know in place so as i'm saying when there is a failure of all these things like even after the timeout of the retry and even the fallback api is not working then you can look for look into your you know caching mechanism and get the data from the uh, cache you know whatever the you know uh, data that you have you know successfully cached in the previous uh, transaction use that and then you know immediately you can uh, you know process that as a success response back to your client and the last one is static results as fallback so uh, static results as fallback is the it's it, it, i would say the very final leg you know for uh, your fault tolerant api to be a fault tolerant uh, because you have a series of steps to follow and uh, before this step you have a caching mechanism for example uh, the cache is not available or the data uh, that you are looking for is really new it is not really added to the cache then you have to look for the static results and this static results it may not be uh, you know uh, may not fit for all your you know implementation so uh, this is mainly we can call you know uh, reference data transaction what is reference data transaction 
so there are uh, data that you're looking for you know uh, which should be a reference for your processing and those data are mostly static it won't get changed uh, you know uh, at any point of time or it will change you know very uh, at rare cases for example uh, you know i'm going to uh, build a state budget right so i need some state information out of that so my state information will be having uh, you know uh, starting information for example uh, what would be my state name what would be my uh, you know uh, how many districts are in my state and uh, what when the state got formed and how many district courts are there and how many airports are there how many railway stations are there so this are you know minimal static information you know that would be uh, you know seeing through to the back end and get the information and this information never mostly change or uh, rarely change so that's where you know we use the starting information so we configure this you know values in any of your configuration file if none of the options are working then you get this data and you know uh, generate response out of it and send back so this is the last uh, leg in your uh, in a fault tolerant api so in general uh, the overall strategy like you know how your api going to work is so assume this is your upstream api and this is your you know current api where your uh, you know api is being fault tolerant and uh, when there's a downstream api is failing for some reason it is timed out then you can you know very well go for the fallback options so fallback options is you know make a call to any of your deprecated api or uh, any of your um, you know, uh, the replica for the API that is available in the DR site or in a similar system having the same set of data. So that's your fallback mechanism. Even if the fallback mechanism is failing, then you go and look for the client, you know, client caching. Even if the client caching is not available, then you go for static results. If it, if it case up with the reference data. So this is how you can, you know, uh, st uh, strategize your uh, plan of having your API fault tolerant. So, let's talk about few use cases uh, scenarios okay so let's take a scenario one so we have an api client and it is having a sla of uh, two seconds per sec uh, no per record so it is expecting a, a response to be in place you know uh, within two seconds and uh, it makes a call to ap implementation and the ap implementation you know uh, having a dependency of making one more downstream api call and the downstream api call having a sla for responding within 800 milliseconds so, and uh, second thing is there is no fallback API available and this is not a reference data call. So what are all the strategy we can apply to this scenario, uh, you know, to make your API fault tolerant? We can use timeout because we need to ensure that uh, your, you know, uh, actual API has to wait only for 800 millisecond when it's making a downstream API call. So if it finds out, uh, you know, you're not getting response, you can very well go, you know, go on time, uh, you know, do the timeout and go for the retry. Uh, that also should be a specific retry. For example, we can do the, uh, you know, retry for two times at the max. So that because the overall retry time should limit within the matter of two seconds. And uh, even if a retry fails, you can get the data from the client side caching and, you know, respond back. This was scenario one. In scenario two, the same API client having a max response time of one second per. So it is very, you know, very limited time now. So you have to respond back within a matter of a second. And the same case that goes for API implementation, your downstream API implementation having a uh, SLA of 800 millisecond. So the downstream API is failing for timeout. And also there is no, there is no fallback API available, but it's a reference data call. So what would be strategy you can apply here? So strategies are again you can set a time mode, but in this case you cannot do a retry because of the very you know uh, less number of uh, SL you have with your upstream API client. So what you can do is immediately you can look for the client side caching, and still if it's not available you can go to the static results. It's because this is being a reference data call. And the next one is scenario three. So here the API client is having a resp uh, you know a response time of uh, two seconds per request. And uh, your API implementation is dependent on the downstream system that is having 500 millisecond SLA per request. And here we have a fallback API mechanism available and this is not a reference data call. The strategies would be, again, you can configure the timeout that is a very you know, initial leg and you can apply for the retry because you have a two seconds of uh, SLA and your downstream API is going to respond within 500 milliseconds. So at least you can apply either one or two or retries to that 
and it's still not working, you can make a call to the fallback API and try to see the response from them. If it's still not working, you can make a client side caching to respond back. And you might be having question, instead of why should why should I go for client side cache immediately uh, right uh, before going to the fallback API? Yeah, it depends on the case. So if your particular data is not going to change often, definitely instead of going for fallback API, you can definitely take the value from the client side caching and you know apply it. If the if the values are going to change or you are like you know is frequently changing and obviously you have to depend then you have to go for fallback api as a you know a, a first option before to the client side caching so it's, it's the strategies to apply is purely depend on your requirement is purely depend on, depend on your organization capability so you can play around with the strategy it depends on like how the api you know uh, going to be and where it is going to fit in so let's have a quick demo. So is there anyone having question before I switch to demo? Vijay, we have uh, some questions like uh, from Santil, like could you help us to understand on high strict fallback method versus fallback API? Yeah. So fallback API is as I mentioned, right? So this is your primary API, which is going to, which is failing for some reason. Probably the API having some issues or the primary API having a call issue with the downstream system. So that's where you have an option of fallback uh, mechanism. The fallback mechanism is, for example, if your API is down, but your downstream uh, system is up, then you can look for to use uh, any deprecated version or the previous version of the API that is available. Fallback. You can still use it. That's that particular API can still talk to the downstream and get the data for you. And the difference could be, you know, um, maybe the new uh, in, uh, new features would not be available in the previous version, but still it is compatible for your, you know, uh, data processing where the required and sufficient uh, record fields are, you know, coming back as sufficient. And uh, if the particular API, the deprecated version of the API is not available, then you can look for the option of a replica of that API, where the replica of the API would be available. Some organization, as I said, would be maintaining the disaster recovery site for the, uh, you know, uh, for the fail safe mechanism. So you can go to the DS site and call the API and get the data. This is one, this is fallback option two. And uh, another option is, like in multiple organization, one, more than one, uh, you know, system or component uh, going to retain the, you know, uh, data. So in that case, you can look for another system API, which talk to another data system, probably system B. It can gives you the same set of data. Probably the data between the system A and system B may not be in sync, but the subset of information is, you know, kind of if it is required for you, then you can still go ahead and call this, you know. Uh, you know the, the the kind of similar kind of API and may you know get the data and uh, make the response out of it. This is fallback three. Does it answer your question? Uh, hey, uh, Santil, like does that? Yes. Okay. Next question, like from Melvin, scatter gather or first successful? Could you explain, like Melvin, what are you asking? Uh hi. Hi Vijay, you were showing one of the slides like uh, you showed a scatter gather and uh, you're calling the similar API sites, right? Yeah. So scatter gather, right? So as I have said, this is called you know, uh, it is actually though the the terminology is little awkward. They call this an egoistical approach to the API invocation. Why? Because you know you can think okay why should i wait for uh you know uh you know for my primary api to fail first and then i go for the fallback api so instead i'm going to make a call using a scatter gather right so i'm going to make a call to the primary api as well as the fallback api and whichever gives me a response i'm going to process it yes that's an intelligent idea but it is not a standard process it is applicable only on certain exceptional cases. For example, if you are making a call to the primary API, so that is going to give you the option of 99% going to be stable. 
and only there is a you know uh, fail scenario of 1% then making a call to the fallback api you know as many number of times equivalent to the primary api is completely unnecessary and this is going to create a processing overhead for your api that in turn creates a processing overhead for your application networks because a, you're increasing a load right and when it is recommended is when you have upstream api which has some strong sla and it is critical uh, that you know it is expecting 100% availability of your data then definitely you can utilize this option. You can use a scatter gather, which, which is going to do the parallel invocation of both primary and fallback API. But this is a very, very rare scenario. Like usually any you know, organization will not adapt for it, only on the exceptional cases. Yeah, so here I think if can we use the first successful? So it will it will be calling only the first successful, right? Then it will yes. Yeah, see, the, you have to consider multiple, you know, points here. First of all, you should be having the fallback API should be in place. Second thing is, the what kind of fallback API you are using? Is it a deprecated version of the primary API, or is it a replica of the primary API sitting in the DR site, or is it a similar kind of API uh, that talks to a different system that is going to give you back the, uh, you know, a similar kind of data? Okay, if that is the case, how would be the data things? So there are multiple points you have to consider before you implementing it. So that's where the review board will you know will think of this you know API design, whether this you know scatter gather is really required in place you know before implementing it. I'm not saying we should not. I'm saying only when the criteria are met. Okay. Any more questions before I go to the demo? Do anyone have any questions? Okay, you can proceed to demo. Yep. Okay, so uh, this is a small demo. Okay, and uh, just to give you a side of it. So, uh, you know, I've just created a simple API. Okay, so where I'm going to uh, get the state information for, for example, uh, this is kind of, I would say a government body. So which need a state information for you know budget preparation. So they are going to make an, you know, API call. So, uh, that's going to give the state information and this information are, you know, kind of, uh, more similar and, uh, uh, it's kind of more reference data type, type call. And uh, this information are, you know, never changes or rarely changes. So, what are the options I'm going to implement here is, so I'm just going to, you know, pass the state name uh, in the API query parameter, and I'm going to expect this response. So this response will be having the state level information of name, capital, airport details, uh, districts, high courts, bench court, and uh, economical port, headquarters, everything, you know, it is going to give me back. And how I am going to make my API fault tolerant here. So what are the strategies I'm going to apply that I'm going to explain? So as part of the implementation, so what I've done is, so as soon as I have, I am receiving the call, the get call. So I'm going to orchestrate the process. So what is my first process here is, so I'm going to make a call to the primary API, the actual primary API. And, and I already set up the, uh, you know, the timeout based on the SLA configure. So the response timeout so it would be a 300 milliseconds for the api to respond me back and uh, and apart from that if you look at that i'm doing a retry so if any case of failure that is happening i'm doing a retry out of that so the retry i'm doing is two retries and the 500 milliseconds between each retry so the second step it goes for the retry so if uh, if the retry is still getting exhausted then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go for the fallback mechanism. I'm having a fallback API. So ideally fallback API, uh, you know, does, uh, because HTTP is being synchronous and it is SLA bounded, you cannot do a retry for a fallback as well. Okay. So I'm going to make a call to fallback API and try to get the response from the fallback API. If still my fallback API is not working, then I'm going to look into the cache that I've loaded for the previous response. So if I get the response from the cache, then I'm obviously going to, you know, send that response back to them. 
and even if my cache is failing then my next strategy would be take the response from the static so i know this particular of data is you know available uh, you know uh, and and one which is not going to change so as part of the process one sec my toolkit is hanging yep so i'm going to you know have this kind of any configuration file about the data and i'm just going to do the response for it okay and this response is sent back to the system and they can you know able to process it further so this is how the strategy is implemented here so to make the api call failure i deliberately you know uh, configure an incur port for the primary and fallback api and let's see through the logs how it is you know uh, working in terms of the uh, and how this api is being fault tolerant here let me run the project Yes, the API got deployed. Let me clear the console and let me run the API. Yes. So you could see I got the response back and the total time taken is four seconds. So let me probably rerun it as it's being a first API call. There will be some latency. Let me rerun it. Yeah. Now I got the response in one millisecond. I mean, so one second. So let me go through the logs. So as you see, first it says the you know received request for detail of the state information for the state Tamil Nadu. And uh, first, the process is initiating the process, and the first leg is it is making the you know invocation for the backend API, and it finds out there is an issue with the API call. And as soon as it finds out, it goes into the retry mode. So it's actually be connected to issues. So what it's going to do is it is going to retry for two times, and the frequency between each retry is 500 milliseconds. So here you can see it. It goes on the retry. It says the API back and invocation is invocation failed, retrying now. And it is happening for the first retry. Again, the same error comes. Then it goes as retry two. Attempt of one out of two. Again, the same uh, exception comes. A second time they're again retrying. Here also it fails. Now the retry is being exhausted. So here you can see the retry is being exhausted. So what it finds out is so it is exhausted. Then it says the primary API invocation is failed after retries. It's switching the strategy to call the fallback API. So now I'm making a fallback API. Though my fallback API is available, but currently it is also down for some reason. So 
there is still you know call failure happen for the fallback api and uh, it says the fallback api invocation is failed and it switched the strategy to fetch from the cache and when it look for the cache the data is not found so the next process it says is the previous response is not available in cache and it's switching the strategy the next strategy would be like initiate to generate the response from the static results which i have shown in the configuration file and uh, it generates a response out of it that's what you see here so by having this this api becomes you know uh, fault tolerant and uh, it ensures you know to uh, revive your you know failure transaction into a successful state and it makes your application network intact and uh, that's all about it and uh, any questions you guys have i can take up we have one question from sudhir like can we can can we consider message queue option under fault tolerant strategies to process the failed request later at a later point of time see uh you definitely we can do but when you are going to do a, uh, when you are going to have your http transaction as uh, having a asynchronous uh, form of methodology but what we are talking about is a synchronous form of methodology like your immediate response is really dependent uh, you know uh, by your uh, upstream api client but if it is going to be asynchronous obviously you can go with the mqs and uh, either you can go with the you know vmqs or you can go with the endpoint mq in if it case of asynchronous and specifically that is kind of you know recommended for the batch based process where i just going to you know uh, it's a kind of fire and forget mode of implementation where you get the request and you process it in batch and if there is still failure happens you can apply the you know uh, a number of retries to it until it is successful does it answer your question yes okay any more questions do we have any more questions like you your mic is enabled you can ask just any time thank you vijay for the detailed description and the explanation thank you precious is mine and uh, like feel free to drop your feedback if anything that uh, you know we need to uh you know improve our presentation quality and everything definitely will improve please feel to drop your feedback yeah yeah please uh, provide your feedback after this uh, session so that we can come up with a new topics also based on your uh, suggestions Uh, so this, this so this topic you know we have bring uh, you know we have come up with majorly on like you know uh, towards your solutioning and designing approach Uh, so uh, these are the key factor you have to consider you know when you are going to involve on design and solutioning phase so probably you guys you know few of them being a developer now but there will be a stage that you have to step in you know to a uh, architect level so you have to consider all these things or at least you you should be have the aware awareness of all this uh, you know solutioning part and uh, you can provide a guidance to your team when there such things are being missed yeah which i one query uh, so like we have discussed about the uh, end systems fault tolerant mechanisms like as a front facing from mule soft side uh, fault tolerant strategies can we uh, apply to the client basically so it's all about you know uh, which api you are making fault tolerant right so mostly process api uh, it's considered to have you know make the fault tolerant because process api Uh, this is, there should be basic fault tolerant in all the api layer okay so uh, the the basic uh, strategy is to have a retries when there is a consecutive you know consecutive uh, failures in your call okay but implementing the strategies of uh, you know fallback apis uh, and then uh, caching the results so these this specifically i would say the static results and you know fallback api so that comes under under your orchestration layer whereas uh, the caching and the retry timer parameters you can still you know configure in other uh, api layers yeah thank you and like uh, load balancer and making a cluster uh, these also comes under fault tolerance right? basically yeah so this this is uh, what we are talking about like you know handling your api uh, within the code level 
like making the apis fault tolerant yeah thanks makes sense any more questions i don't I think, think we have any left. question okay There's no more questions in the chat so i leave the floor to shubham